Good afternoon, and welcome to the ACES Northwest Network Seminar Series, Charge Up Your Fleet event. We're here today to help you prepare to launch the EV fleet of the future now. The ACES Northwest Network is dedicated to advancing the deployment of emerging mobility and energy technologies in the Pacific Northwest. Here to get us kicked off for today's event is the director of the ACES Northwest Network, Bruce Agnew. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> My name is Bruce Agnew, and I am the co-chair of the Pacific Northwest Economic Regions Transportation Group. Um, Pinwar is a five-state, five-province uh, organization of public-private partnership, and I'm also the director of the nonprofit ACES Northwest Network. We are a technology and major employer alliance dedicated to the acceleration of technology and transportation. I'm gonna come back and explain that to a greater degree in a, in a minute. Um, we are staffed by the nonprofit Cascadia Center of Discovery Institute, which was launched through a grant from the Henry M. Jackson Foundation way back in uh, 1994. From 2003 to 2013, uh, Cascadia received a 10-year grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And with that funding, we launched the Beyond Oil Transforming Transportation Program. And we looked at uh, electric cars. Uh, and of course, back then we didn't have Teslas or, or Rivian or some of these uh, exotic models. Now we were dealing with um, some basic e-cars. E, uh, e uh, we come a long way. And to welcome us today, it's my real pleasure to introduce Conrad Lee. Conrad is, is a good friend. Uh, he has been on the Bellevue City Council for 28 years. He is a liaison for various committees uh, and regional associations, including the Economic Development District. But most importantly, uh, Conrad is the leading voice on the Bellevue City Council to accelerate technology in transportation and have Bellevue assume a, a rightful position as one of the smartest and most innovative cities uh, in the country. Uh, Conrad and I have traveled to China together and, and uh, uh, Conrad works very closely with the business community through the Bellevue Chamber in promoting the smart mobility plan that was adopted uh, back in 2018 with a technology le levy that then council member uh, Kevin Wallace um, sponsored. And Conrad has been our go-to guy on the Bellevue City Council for all things related to technology and ACES. So Conrad, can you welcome us? Hey, we are gonna ask Conrad to unmute. Can Mr. Lee, sir, you are, you are muted. Sorry about that. Oh, there you go. I was, here we go. <laughs> I was talking to myself for a while. But anyway, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here to welcome you to ACES Networks work, workshop or webinar on charging uh, our fleet. Uh, I, I've been a big advocate. I believe in electrical uh, cars and I believe in uh, autonomous vehicle. And I think this is our future. Uh, through transportation, and we will develop this technology for almost anything that affects our life. Uh, so uh, I have been working with uh, visionaries such as Tom Elbow uh, almost 10 years ago. I shared this vision with him. And uh, perhaps now is the time uh, to bring this to life. So I'm really excited that we are talking about you know, this topic. Uh, as you know, Bellevue will be, I hope, the nexus of tech-enabled mobility services, including new shared ride models and new logistic services, including drone deliveries and autonomous shuttles. Cooperation with employers and Bellevue-based companies is essential to ensure the broadest possible benefits. Charging infrastructure for EVs go hand in hand 
with new solar energy deployments on buildings and on site battery energy storage infrastructure, ensuring the grid remains visible and energy is available 24 seven. New buildings will incorporate EV charging preparations and accommodate on-site energy production and storage. Bellevue's business community is ready to embrace new technologies in transportation because they recognize that the pandemic has altered how we move about and the expectations that people have regarding the delivery of goods and services. We must embrace new solutions because 25,000 plus new jobs are coming to Bellevue in downtown Bellevue. What does this future hold? How about the distributor, a tunnel for full autonomous delivery and passenger EV, clean, no emission, safe, that operate out of sight, out of weather and without conflicts. It's only possible with a robust charging infrastructure that helps downtown Bellevue remain an attractive home for families, businesses and events. So I'm glad to say that the Bellevue is moving towards some of these uh, implementations. For example, I just learned that our environmental stewardship group has just worked with PSC uh, for, a for a grant that is going to install a couple of charging stations. But it is even more than that. We realize that Amazon is coming time and they you know, are going to be looking at ways how to deliver their goods. Uh, you know, uh, we know that in the last decade, uh, the uh, use you know, of, of uh, remote work, remote work has increased at the rate of 30% growth over the last decade in the US. That's even before the pandemic. So now with the pandemic, we realize it's gonna be accelerated you know, of remote uh, workstation. That means we will use a lot of electric vehicle delivery, uh, autonomous delivery. So the future is in front of us, ahead of us. So I'm really glad that I was, we are able, the city of Bellevue, uh, to participate in this private public partnership. And I thank you for attending. We hope that we can learn a lot from this session and looking forward to even more discussion toward bringing this to life. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Um, that was great. We, we also want to recognize uh, the excellent work in implementing the smart mobility plan by the, your staff at Bellevue, Andrew Sigalakis, the transportation director, and Chris Long and, and their crew do a great job in, in uh, implementing technology and overlaying technology into their normal transportation plans. Um, and we think Bellevue is a template for the rest of the Puget Sound area as well, well as the country. Um, this slide shows uh, our graphics for the four technologies that ASA stands for, uh, specifically autonomous connected uh, vehicles connected to the cloud, connected to each other and connected to infrastructure. Uh, electric, which is the focus of today's session, uh, electrification, of uh, consumers vehicles, of public fleets like the city of Bellevue or transit fleets. We'll hear more about that. Um, electrification of private fleets. Rivian and Amazon have announced a 100,000 EV deployment um, for their Amazon Prime and delivery services. And that is actually the largest commercial EV uh, deployment in, in the world uh, as of now. Uh, so we're excited to bring them to, um, to Bellevue. Amazon is Bellevue's hometown. Um, and we are um, a unique collection uh, working together. Uh, the thing about ACES is that transportation technology uh, benefits our society in general by reducing carbon. Um, we recently presented at the State Transportation Commission a program on clean energy uh, meets green transportation. ACES can also save lives. Uh, certainly Conrad Bellevue is committed as the rest of the region is to vision zero, to reducing fatalities and automated vehicles can do that. 
promoting shared rides and transit connections and reducing congestion by getting more people into fewer vehicles in and out of work. We also are committed to social justice and we have a special uh, section called ACES for All where we're looking at mobility opportunities for folks in low-income neighborhoods, particularly around the Renton, SeaTac, Tukwila, Burien, and South King County area. And we can uh, review that uh, at a later date. Uh, next slide. Okay, we're very proud of our co-chairs. Uh, they are Tom Alberg, uh, managing partner at Madrona Venture Group. Tom is also a board member of Challenge Seattle, which is 17 CEOs staffed by former Governor Chris Gregoire and a 23 year Amazon board member. Um, Brian Mistily is our other co-chair. Brian actually comes from the Detroit area and was uh, a leader with Ford and then Microsoft Automotive before he founded his own company called Inrex, which you may have read about in the, in the media. They are a worldwide traffic data and navigation company with contacts all over the country and, and the world. Tom and Brian both serve on the State Autonomous Vehicle uh, Work Group Executive Committee, as well as the Seattle Times Traffic Lab Advisory Board, along with Kemper Freeman from Bellevue. Um, one thing I, I want to mention, we don't have it on the on this video, but uh, to really understand how ACES tracks together, um, you, you should look at a Tomorrow Transformed CNN program that will be airing shortly. Uh, it has Brian uh, featured for the first four and a half minutes of the 23 um, minute program. Uh, all about ACES and how it all uh, works together. So it's on our website and um, you might wanna take a, a look at that. Um, can we put up the uh, slide about the GeekWire story on Tom? Okay, and finally, okay, these are our leading ACES affiliates. As you can see, we're very involved in it with a variety of companies and technology companies in, in the region. I, I did wanna just reference, uh, there's a, a great uh, GeekWire story, a profile of Tom Alberg talking about how he made the early investment in Jeff Bezos's idea for an online bookstore and subsequently his rich legacy of community service. Uh, again, the, this is a list of some of our partners and active members, and we thank them for their support. I'm going to turn it now back over to Scott to go over some of our research projects. And thank you, Bruce. Before we uh, get into our research, it would be good to go back and point out what we have been accomplishing in 2020. We held a number of events in 2020, and these are three of the events that we produced at the ACES Northwest Network. Our Electrify SeaTac event was extremely popular, and that's where we first um, laid out some of the plans that the Port of Seattle is undertaking, along with a couple of electric aircraft manufacturers to decarbonize air transportation in the Pacific Northwest. Our future of commuting event was very intriguing. We had a design firm from Seattle that holds the longest standing contract for design, um, and that happens to be with Boeing. Teague Design presented on the future of transportation and logistics. Uh, and of course, our 2020 event sponsor, Verizon, was able to join us. And our record-breaking attendance at the annual meeting um, was just extremely wonderful to see that people are becoming very interested in the work that we are doing in the ACES Northwest Network to bring these technologies to life and to bring them to the Pacific Northwest. If you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, we of course invite you to follow us on LinkedIn at ACES and, uh, well, yes, let's talk about the Mobility Minute first. Um, we are publishing every month a newsletter. If you would like to receive our newsletter, we invite you to join the 1,000 people that are already receiving this newsletter by signing up at cascadia.center and slash um, subscribe, cascadia.center slash subscribe. And when you sign up for that, you'll receive just one Mobility News Minute newsletter each month. And you'll also receive occasional and uh, updates regarding our up coming events. We're not going to spam your inbox, but we are going to keep you informed. And going back to LinkedIn, uh, 
it would be great if you could follow us at ACES NW Network on LinkedIn. That's where we often post about upcoming events. And we also post about the work that our partners and affiliates in the ACES Northwest Network are undertaking. So we invite you to follow us on LinkedIn and we'll be in touch. And our next event will be occurring in mid-May. We've called it Going Vertical. It'll be all about the deployment of advanced air mobility in urban areas all throughout the West Coast and particularly uh, the wonderful opportunities that we have here in Seattle to prepare for disaster recovery and to provide mobility options that can meet the needs of a wide variety of travelers. So we invite you to look forward to going vertical with us at the ACES Northwest Network. Bruce and I are thrilled to be working together and we've enjoyed working together for the past four years um, to bring this growth to the network. And at any time we invite you to reach out to us, we're happy to collaborate and happy to hear from you, uh, our ACES affiliates. And of course, we wanna hear from you today. You have an opportunity to be engaged this afternoon using the Q&A button in Zoom. It's at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions during the presentations, please use the Q&A button and type your questions there. We plan to allow for time to answer questions after each of our three presentations today. If we can't answer your question live, we will certainly work with our presenters to perhaps type a response. And if you'd like to be in touch with our presenters, we can facilitate that as well. Today, we're going to talk to you about charging up your fleets. And I thought I'd start out with a brief presentation on understanding the fundamentals of EV fleet needs and costs. We are at a particularly prescient moment in history, an opportunity to decarbonize our transportation system without additional cost. But let's first talk about some terminology. Not everyone who joins our webinars is an expert, and we certainly want to help people understand some of the terminology that you might be hearing related to vehicle electrification. If you hear the term kilowatt hour, you can think of that as a gallon of energy, perhaps uh, stored in a battery. Energy is stored, power is delivered. So if you hear the term kilowatt, think about gallons per minute. Think about energy being delivered through a cable. And when you hear the term volt, you always want to think about the analogy of pressure in a pipe. So when we talk about kilowatt hours, we're talking about storing energy in batteries. And when we're talking about kilowatts, we're talking about delivering power. One of the most important trends that's taking place in the vehicle industry right now is that higher voltages mean that less current can be used to deliver the same amount of energy. In other words, it allows us to either create smaller cable sizes or deliver more energy with the same cable size. And that's an important trend. It's part of the change in how quickly electric vehicles can charge. I did a bit of analysis in preparing for this event and I thought I would put up this slide. You may not agree with every number in this slide. Some of it is based on what we expect to happen in the near future. Some of it is based on technologies that are being deployed today. But to give you a sense of the difference between heavy vehicles such as class eight trucks and light vehicles such as cars, you can see that typically heavy vehicles need to store anywhere from seven to 10 times more energy on board. That's because they're typically using um, approximately 10 times more energy per mile driven. And so if you think about that, it's actually um, demonstrates to us the efficiency of the electric drivetrain. A large truck might get anywhere between six to 10 miles per gallon, whereas uh, a medium sized car might return more than 30 miles to the gallon, a difference of approximately three to five. And here you can see that um, we're actually using 2.5 to 3.5 kilowatt hours per mile, but there's a lot less energy loss in electric drivetrains. Right now we're seeing cars with um, ranges of 450 miles, which I think is just incredible. And we hope that that continues to be the case, um, that we see more range in light vehicles, especially as we experience shorter charging times. One of the most important trends that we see happening right now, and I think Mike Euston might touch on this during his presentation, is that the drivetrain architectures for these vehicles are moving to higher voltages. This means that they can charge more quickly and our charging power is rising. We used to see charging power of about 25 kilowatts. 
Now we're seeing 100 kilowatt chargers uh, all over the place. That's typically what we see with Tesla supercharging system, but the newest charging systems will deliver three times that amount of power. And finally, one of the trends that we've been highlighting here is the need to think about solar plus battery installations. The Honorable Council Member Lee talked to us about the need to deploy solar power all throughout Bellevue to ensure that depot charging and at-home charging could happen without a great deal of impact to the electric grid. A solar plus battery system for your home can cost anywhere from ten dollars to $25,000. Large-scale solar plus battery systems with the capability of storing the charge that might be accepted by a single Class 8 truck cost approximately $30,000 to $50,000, depending on the type of equipment that you're using. With those costs in mind, I prepared this chart. There is no y-axis, and the reason why there is no y-axis on this chart is because these numbers are changing every day as new technologies are deployed and developed. What you see is that a diesel internal combustion engine, uh, the cost of actually using that type of a truck is largely uh, taken up in the energy operating expense. That's the purchase of the fuel. Vehicle operating expenses for uh, diesel ICEs are also higher because of the needs for maintenance. And then of course there's the capital expense. And we are at a point now with battery technology and battery costs falling from $1,000 per kilowatt hour to $100 per kilowatt hour, where we are seeing price parity in smaller vehicles. And as battery technologies have dramatically improved over the past five years, the price parity for battery electric heavy vehicles is also being achieved. Overall, what we see is that BEVs, which is the right-hand bar chart, exhibit approximately a 15 to 20% reduction in amortized residual costs. This assumes that the owner of those vehicles is constructing an on-site fueling infrastructure using solar plus battery systems. So they're not relying on externalized fuel infrastructure as you might with a diesel internal combustion engine vehicle. The fact that you can now fuel the vehicle with almost zero residual cost for energy operational expenses, while also amortizing your energy fueling infrastructure capital expenditure over time and still experience a 15 to 20% reduction is why we believe that this is the moment for heavy vehicle and fleet owners to switch to EVs. And I don't think it would be any surprise to us that switching to EVs now would provide a massive stimulus to the economy. It makes sense for fleet operators and it makes sense for us. If you include a carbon tax, the difference becomes even more dramatic. We haven't taken a position on a carbon tax, but we recognize that carbon taxes may be inevitable and that will further shift the balance in favor of battery electric vehicles, possibly incurring for those vehicles a 25% reduction in residual costs. What are the benefits of those cost savings? Well, of course, cost savings mean that you can spend more money on fleet conversions. We certainly support that in our efforts to decarbonize our transportation infrastructure. Increasing competitive wages is a benefit of falling operational expenses for vehicles. Increasing the quality of service or the frequency of service is a good outcome. And of course, we recognize that amortizing these costs allows companies to hedge against inflationary pressures and against the potential for carbon taxes. Most importantly, however, we recognize that the American people are investors through the stock market, and we can create investor returns by reducing the residual costs. Private equity investment is essential if we want to decarbonize our infrastructure and our fleets. And EV and solar plus battery uh, companies are building wealth for millions. And we expect that hundreds of new startups and expansions will happen in 2020 to 2021. And a number of those will be right here in the Pacific Northwest. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike Euston. Mike is Electromobility League at DKS and Associates, a Portland-based consulting firm. And Mike and I have previously been competitors, but now we're partnering to advance electromobility throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I'm proud to welcome Mike to the program today. Mike, thank you for being here. You want to be sure you're unmuted. Looks like you got it. Thanks, Mike. Right. I didn't know if I could unmute. Hey, hey it's, great. it's great to be here. Uh, hang on one second. Ignore that. Um, 
thanks, Scott, uh, for the introduction. And um, uh, you want to bring up my slides and I can kind of, uh, or do you want me to present directly? I can do that if you want me to share my um, slide either way. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for presenting yourself. We appreciate that. No worries. Here for you. The, the, the magic of, of the internet, the cloud, I guess, as it were. Uh, so is my slide visible okay? It says the future of fleet electrification. Am I in the right place? So before I get started, just a quick introduction. Um, uh, my life has been taken over by fleet electrification in the last couple of years. I've been focusing... Uh, DKS Associates, as Scott mentioned, is a, is a transportation engineering and planning firm headquartered in Portland, but I'm out of our Seattle office. But the most of the work that I'm doing is actually in California, because that's where uh, California is a little bit ahead of us in a lot of ways from an electromobility perspective, largely because they have funding. They also have a lot more vehicles that are electrified because it's a ZEV state, and, and hopefully at some point in the not too distant future, that will happen here in Washington as well. Um, but I'm working right now with, with fleets like the city of Oakland and Dublin and Albany and Hayward and Alameda County and Berkeley and Fremont, and lots of other cities down there. Up here, I'm working for uh, King County. I, I did a project for King County Metro for the city of Seattle and several others. So, um, the, but the project, uh, I'm, I'm not going to really get into the projects today. Instead, what I want to talk about are some of the trends, uh, di dive a little deeper in some of the things that Scott was talking about that present the context. If you are a fleet manager and would like to learn more, I'd be more than happy to geek out with you on all the, the, the doodads that are directly applicable to fleets. But for this audience, I wanted to keep it a little higher level. So I'm gonna be focusing a little bit on sort of the, just bring everybody up to speed with what I call Electromobility 101, talk about some of the benefits, uh, talk a little bit about the forecasts and some of the trends that are, are affecting us. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So the, the terms that I use don't, don't confuse folks. Um, there's three different types of charging, level one, two, and some people call it three or DC fast charging. Um, these are primarily uh, low speed for residential. Uh, the fleets tend to use level two charging, although for fleet use, DC fast charging also makes a lot of sense but there's some labor issues that are involved in that because you need someone physically to do that. Uh, so we generally recommend a combination of uh, level two charging as well as DC fast or even high power charging. And this depends on some variables such as the duty cycle of the vehicles, meaning how much the, that vehicle drives over the course of the day and how long it has at, typically at night to charge, uh, as well as some other factors, unions and various other things. I'm working right now with King County to develop some issues, um, some evaluations on that. So here's sort of a diagram that kind of shows it real conceptually. Basically, the less expensive chargers tend to take longer to charge. The more expensive, the, the faster the charge. And as Scott mentioned, with higher voltages, um, batteries can charge much more quickly. With the cost of battery storage coming down, that presents some opportunities. And some of the newer technologies that I'll talk about in a second, I think are very exciting and really create some opportunities. There are several different charging systems out there, different charging plugs. These are what they look like in a diagram diagrammatic perspective. Um, and um, you know they, they vary from vehicle make to vehicle make, primarily with uh, Tesla being sort of the outlier, but uh, between um, the Asian manufacturers like Nissan and uh, Mitsubishi with, they, they use the Chatamo standard, whereas uh, here we tend to use the J1772 and, and um, and the SAE combo. Um, one of the things that people need to know, and this is really important, is that, and again, Scott tied on, uh, touched on this a little bit, is that not all vehicles are created equal when it comes to charging acceptance rates. So the onboard charger on an EV uh, is, is, is the limiting factor for AC charging. And so um, when you're planning your charging, it's really important to rec recognize this. The good news is that Hopefully, the, the, uh, and what we're seeing is already with the more expensive vehicles, they tend to have higher acceptance rates, um, but we're starting to see that on the more cost, uh, you know, more sort of fleets, uh, vehicles that are more appropriate for fleets, which tend to be more low cost vehicles. And, and again, the work I, I work on is primarily municipal fleets. I can't speak for corporate fleets. We haven't done any of those yet, although I, they're, they're going to need our services, I believe. Um, but um, until recently, we haven't had very many options. That's changing radically, and I'm going to show some slides in a minute that depict that. So how do these chargers get applied? Well, there's multiple different types. Uh, there's residential, there's workplace, there's public, there's fleet, and there's destination charging. 
uh, all of which have different types of chargers. And I think most people here are probably familiar with at least some of those. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Um, and how do you find them? Well, this thing usually can tell you where to look. You also usually have the, a comparable app on your dashboard if you're driving an EV, but there's many different apps, particularly PlugShare here, which shows where the different, um, the different charges are located. Range anxiety has been a traditional, traditionally the foe of electromobility. And um, as we get more and more public chargers, that's addressing that. And those chargers are, can, you can find them using technology like your, your smartphone app. Let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits. Um, my favorite benefit of all is that their electro motors are more efficient than internal combustion engines. Internal combustion engines are great at generating heat. And that's what most of the power, most of the, the BTUs goes into heat generation. Unfortunately, that gets wasted through the radiator. Uh, with electromobility, almost all of the electricity is used to turn the wheels, torsion, and that's really what it's all about. So, so one of the major benefits, and I think, you know, if you get down to the physics level, the reason that I believe that EVs are superior to other forms of, of uh, traction power is because it's just more efficient from a physics perspective, as this diagram illustrates. And so it's essentially, um, uh, you know, a third more, uh, more efficient. Of course, you know, we live in a in an urban area where pollution is very important. We we tend right now the uh, climate is is gets the focus, but even without climate, um, there's there's criteria air pollutants that are regulated by the EPA, uh, which which um, electric vehicles don't produce out of their tailpipe. It depends, of course, on the fuel source for the for the energy. Uh, but here in the Northwest, where we rely primarily on hydropower. Um, we have, have a much a very clean grid, and so we have clean vehicles. Um, so obviously reduced GHG emissions are really important. This is a comparison of three different types of vehicles. Um, and as you can see, a uh, all electric vehicle basically doesn't, doesn't generate any uh, um, GHG emissions. Uh, costs. Fleet managers care, unlike th those of us who buy our own vehicles, we typically think of what the cost is when we, when we take the vehicle off the lot. But from a fleet vehicle's uh, fleet manager's perspective, the maintenance costs are really critical. And um, the green on the top are all electric vehicles. These are other combinations of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles here on the bottom, uh, the plug-in hybrids in the yellow. Uh, but by compared to, to all of the different uh, power plants, electric vehicles have significantly reduced savings just because they don't need any of these consumables, spark plugs, oil changes, transmissions, all that stuff that wears out. There's just far fewer moving parts, saves, saves a lot of cost. Um, and then of course, over the lifetime that fuel adds up uh, over a 10 year period, uh, this is some data from the city of Seattle. Um, there's a significant reduction. It's about a three quarter reduction over a 10 year period in, in fuel costs uh, because electricity, especially here in the Northwest is, is a bargain compared to um, uh, gasoline. And then on a, on a per mile basis, uh, again, um, electric vehicles are, are quite a bit more cost effective on a per mile basis. And that, that if you're a fleet manager, that's very important as well. Oops, skip the slide. So on a TCO basis, total cost of ownership, which is really when you combine all of these, these metrics together, uh, this is data from the city of New York's fleet, which has the largest municipal fleet in the country. Um, uh, this shows that the, the gas vehicle here on the right is quite a bit more uh, than this. And, and one of the reasons that, get, that's factored, that needs to be factored in is the residual vehicle, uh, the resi residual value of the vehicle at the end and electric vehicles can hold their value well, depending on the vehicle itself. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future, where we're going in terms of EV adoption. So um, um, this is data from ITS Davis, uh, where I, we just completed, actually I'm in the process of completing a project today uh, for their electric mobility plan. Um, but range is growing and battery prices are falling. And as, as Scott mentioned, the, the confluence of those two trends uh, really uh, bodes well for electric mobility. If we're, if, you know, depending on who you speak with, but we're expecting somewhere between next year or the year after price of an EV at, when you take it off the lot will hit parity with an ICE vehicle. And the reason for that is largely due to falling energy storage prices, that is in, um, improving batteries. Um, but there's all other benefits as well, such as the, the, uh, the economy of scale of the industry as it, as it matures. Uh, up until recently, it's really been a very much a startup industry. It's starting to approach maturity and that's going to have huge benefits as larger and larger numbers of vehicles are produced. 
So these are some uh, future projections of uh, future EV sales going forward, as well as this is this is where it's been up until um, up until the middle of last year, and this is going forward. So obviously continued growth for quite some time. From a demographics perspective, obviously different demographics uh, will adopt EVs at a different rate. Again. Largely right now, electric vehicles are more expensive than, than the other types of vehicles, both plug-in hybrid and hybrid and um, internal combustion engine vehicles. But of course that will change. And as that does, that will change the demographics uh, of when people first buy their first EV. Let's see, um, here's uh, uh, where it's been going forward. Just, I, I think it's just some interesting data. I, I won't dwell on this too much, but um, we can get into this in the discussions later. I wanted to really get to focus on where we're headed because I think that's really where I think the most interesting part of this whole discussion is going. So I wanna talk about five different, what I call the emerging, emerging trends of electromobility. Uh, the first is the mobility revolution and that's the context. That's all about the ACEs that, that Bruce was talking about. The second is the choices that we haven't had until now, but are about to. And I think that's gonna change things significantly. I'm gonna talk a little bit about energy storage and faster charging and why that makes a difference. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the smart technologies that fleet managers are using. And of course the consultants who support those fleet managers. And then lastly, the, the confluence of two really important industries that's transportation and energy and how that integration uh, uh, is really um, going to make a difference as um, Council Member Lee uh, referenced in his remarks. So what do we know today? Well, uh, we have, you know, back, uh, and I created the slide back in 2020, so this is a bit dated, it's a couple months old now, but basically in the near term, we have a pretty good idea over the next two years or so, uh, what's going to be out there based on what industry has announced. And we can plan around that. So if you're a fleet manager, we can make predictions on exactly what types of vehicles, what the acceptance rate is, what the range is, what the, what the, what the price is to, to purchase those vehicles and so forth. Beyond that, it gets a little foggier, um, but we can still at least do our planning. And most of the clients that I'm working for are trying to hit specific uh, fleet electrification targets that are consistent with their strategic climate action plans. Cities like Seattle and King County have very specific targets for reducing their carbon footprints. And so we can make plans, but we don't have the specifics, but we have a general sense as to, as to the total electrical loads that those fleets will require. Beyond 2030, it's pretty hard to predict. Um, so one of the things I've been recommending to clients is that we reconsider our recommendations on a continuous basis to take, it, to take advantage of new information that becomes available. And unlike other types of planning, this is we're planning in the world of disruption. Change happens so fast. So it's really important to stay on top of those changes. So those changes include things that we've seen over the last couple of years. And it seems like it's been around for a while, but if you think about it, these, these ACEs, things like shared mobility and electromobility and connected autonomous, that's all really new. I mean, we're still in the infancy. If we look back from 10 years into the future to today, we'll think, wow, they were just getting started back in, in 2021. Um, bike sharing and, and uh, autonomous vehicles. I still confess I have not yet ridden in an autonomous vehicle, but I'm, I'm probably the only person here in this group that hasn't, right? Uh, but in the future, we're actually building today, we're building cars that have no steering wheels, uh, as Cruise Automotive is demonstrating. So this is, this is happening, and this is the kind of things that's really going to be pushing electromobility. How do we work that into our landscape, into our cities? Well, we develop infrastructure, such as uh, electromobility hubs, um, which is the subject uh, to the presentation that we did last week for the Transportation Commission. Um, really important opportunities, but we need to integrate the, the planning of charging infrastructure as we, as we do this, because this is critical infrastructure for, for not just electric vehicles, but for autonomous vehicles, which of course will be electrically powered. Choices. We haven't had a lot of choices. Right now, Tesla controls 70% of the electric vehicle market in the United States, one manufacturer. Why? Because they, they got out in front, they came up with great vehicles and nobody else has caught up yet. Other vehicle manufacturers are trying to. Um, and some examples are companies like Rivian, which is another startup or another startup called Volkswagen. Oh no, Volkswagen's been around a while, but they haven't had any electric vehicles other than you know, very, you know, the e-Golf, which is essentially a compliance vehicle. But they're planning to go all electric in the not too distant future. And they're gonna do that by using a modular platform, which is based on, you know, essentially one chassis that's essentially a, 
a battery with, with a propulsion unit that's connected to it and you can put any body on. And when you do that, you can scale up production very fast because you don't have to build a bunch of specialty vehicles, essentially one skateboard that can use any body type. And if you look at all of the EV startups and even some of the OEMs, the traditional manufacturers, that's, that's their architecture that they're going for. So essentially it's a modular architecture that lends itself to both scalability and production, but also in terms of developing many different types of vehicle platforms. Other things that we're seeing are, are new. So for example, in-wheel motors, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. All that mass can be distributed rather than one single engine like we have in a traditional internal combustion engine vehicle into uh, you have in-wheel propulsion, which turns the wheels and they're smaller, lighter, and more flexible. So for example, um, the Lordstown Motors Endurance pickup truck has four of these, one in each wheel, which allows, it's a very cost-effective way to do all-wheel drive. Some of the vehicles that we're going to be seeing in the not too distant future are light duty vehicles. And these are all products that are coming out within the next two to three years. Um, you know, all light duty vehicles. Uh, we haven't up until recently seen very many SUVs, which of course outsell cars in this country, but we're going to be seeing more of more cars. We're going to be seeing more SUVs. Um, if you go to the, your new Ford dealership, your Ford dealership, you, you will now see these on the lot. This is the, um, Mustang Mach-E, and they they came out at the beginning part of the year, and they're now for sale. Pickup trucks are something that fleet managers are very dependent on. Right now, we don't have any in production. Uh, if you want an electric pickup, you can get one, but they're very expensive. But uh, Tesla, Lordstown Motors, and Rivian are all coming out with those over the next 12 to 24 months or so. On the um, uh, medium duty vehicles side, we're getting more and more vans and trucks. Um, and uh, basically, there's, there's now vehicle options in all different uh, weight classes of medium and heavy duty vehicles, all the way up to class eight, inc including the E Cascadia, which is being manufactured down in Portland um, by, uh, by Daimler, which owns Freight, Freightliner. Let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, technologies that are making a huge difference. Uh, and I think there's no more technology important than batteries, because battery is the heart of or is that the right metaphor? It's the heart, the lungs, it's the stomach. It's basically all of the guts of a uh, of a uh, electric vehicle other than the, the, the motor itself and battery costs are plummeting. Um, and as a result, uh, electric vehicles are able to put in as for, for the same cost or not, not excessively more cost, longer range batteries. And this is an example of the, the first popular EV which is the Nissan Leaf uh, up until, um, 2015, you could get one with a 75 mile range. Today, there are over 200 mile ranges with the Nissan Leaf Plus. Uh, so that's one of the ways that's addressing range anxiety. Although in my personal opinion, I wish they would continue to make short range vehicles specifically targeting fleets because the average municipal fleet vehicle drives somewhere between 25 and 26 and a half miles per day, at least from the, the work that we've been doing for, for our clients. So they don't really need to have a huge amount of battery range. And it would be great if they had low cost, short range vehicles. So if there's any OEMs in the audience today, I, I encourage you to consider uh, maintaining some product line for, for short range vehicles with lower cost, uh, lower entry point, lower entry prices. Um, let's see, range, range is growing. Um, uh, the luxury vehicles that Scott was referring to have, you know, you can get up to 400 miles now on a, you know, the top end Tesla. Um, and certainly the Lucid and some of the other luxury vehicles will have even more uh, range than that. Um, but the medium range has also grown and I think that's really important. So um, 260 miles is now the me median range um, for an EV, which is pretty good. Um, I'm a skier, that'll get me to Crystal Mountain and back. I'm good with that. Battery breakthroughs. Uh, I try really hard to keep up with battery technology and it's hard. Um, there is so much going on. I, I try to junk up the slide with as, with as many examples as possible. I think the one that I'm most excited about are lithium metal batteries because they can be used for far more uh, charging cycles. Therefore, they can last longer. They have higher energy density, which makes them lighter. They can fit in a smaller space and they're less expensive. When we see these vehicles, these batteries in vehicles produced, that will do two things. It will either provide much longer range or provide much lower cost or some combination of the two. That in and of itself is going to revolutionize, revolutionize electromobility. There's lots of other solid state battery technologies that are in development. 
Um, but all of this is happening. There's billions of dollars in venture capital from Silicon Valley funding this. It's going to happen. It's happening and uh, something to keep track of if you can. Uh, but it's, it takes its full time job just trying to keep track of it. High power chargers. Um, um, high voltage architecture, as Scott was mentioning, uh, has, has certainly uh, changed things uh, or three phase charging with re regular voltage. So um, this is actually an old slide. There are now um, chargers. I think the next slide shows that, that this one here goes up to three megawatts. So um, it's not yet in, available for sale yet, but um, Tritium, which is an Australian ma manufacturer, is building a, uh, a three megawatt charger. That, you know, you're probably not going to need that for your average vehicle, but certainly for medium and, and, and heavy duty vehicles, that makes a lot of sense. And, and David Peterson is here from ChargePoint, and I'm sure that ChargePoint has some exciting things to announce as well. Um, up until recently, the only vehicles that had the high voltage architecture were, were the premier models, but we're starting to see that on, on more, um, more um, medium price vehicles, or even lower price vehicles like um, the um, uh, Kia and I think um, uh, the Hyundai, yeah, the Hyundai Ionic, Ionic if I'm pronouncing that right, five, uh, will also have high powered, uh, high speed charging um, due to um, high voltage architecture. I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about some of the smart technologies that we in the consulting world depend upon and, and we work with our fleet managers as well. Uh, oops. Uh, there we go. So um, on the charging side, uh, we tend to rely heavily on smart charging and certainly on load management. Uh, there's many different types of load management. I'm not going to get into this in much detail because I'm assuming that David's going to cover this in his presentation. Um, there are aftermarket solutions, and then of course, um, uh, various uh, charging manufacturers have this internally. Uh, that makes a huge difference by being able to uh, manage your charging, allows you to manage your load and integrate that with your building. So if you're doing charging in a garage that's associated with the building, the load management can integrate the two systems, that is the, the vehicle fleet as well as the buildings themselves. And that's, that's really important and it provides some great opportunities for resiliency as well. And I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. Data, big data. Um, uh, we're very dependent on data and um, we use, uh, we, you know, we, we would love it if our clients gave us great data from um, telematics platforms and there's a number of them out there. Unfortunately, generally speaking, they don't have that, at least not in a large um, uh, not in large volumes across the fleet. So we, we do the best we can with the data that they provide. Um, but we do have various data analytics tools to, to crunch these numbers. So just like all aspects of ACES, which is very data dependent, electromobility is certainly da data dependent and we have our own data tools. Mobile charging. Charging doesn't have to be static. You can charge up a battery and then move the battery to charge the vehicles. Here's, here's uh, three different examples of this all of which have specific applications for fleets. Uh, for example, if you're a fleet manager and you don't own your vehicle, excuse me, and you don't own your vehicle domicile location, your, your depot, uh, do you really wanna invest millions of dollars in charging infrastructure? Well, one workaround if you have, if, you're, if the lease term is running out is you can instead invest in mobile charging technology that you can take with you to your next site if, if you don't own that facility. Um, or if you are concerned about range, uh, and, and one of your vehicles dies on the road, instead of getting a tow truck, you can bring one of these smart, uh, these spark charges, which is like a jerry jug full of electricity and use that to, to repower the vehicle and get it back to your depot. Um, other kinds of charging technologies. Right now, um, we've been uh, using primarily the, the plug chargers that I've been showing, but technology is advancing very quickly. There's now inductive or wireless charging that's available. And in fact, um, the transit agency in Wenatchee, Washington has been using that for years with success, uh, but it's also becoming dynamic, meaning that there's a company that's based in Israel that's, that's doing it, installing it into roadways so that vehicles will be able to charge while driving. When that happens, of course, it'll put uh, planners like me out of business, but that's okay. This is important going forward. Uh, and the, of course, the chargers themselves can move. VW is developing a robot that literally moves a battery around a garage to charge the vehicles. Um, or you could use something like Power Hydrant, which is a, is a static robot. It stays in one place in the garage, but it can charge up to six vehicles in sequence so that it eliminates the need for um, humans to have to do this in the middle of the night when, when the vehicles are parked. Um, and the last section I wanna talk about is the integration of energy and transportation. Um, 
so one of the things that's really important to my, especially to my, my California clients where they, where the power dies, uh, they have to kill the power every time the wind blows to prevent wildfires uh, in PG&E territory um, is the need to have extra power when, when the, um, when the vehicles, um, so the vehicles can charge even if the grid is down. And so one way to do that, the traditional way is of course on-site generators, but generators get really big and they get expensive, but they can be, they can be mobile as well. Another way is on-site distributed energy resources uh, using solar. And uh, we're doing this in, in rooftop solar as part of the project that we did for several of our clients in the Bay Area um, because they need to have a power source. And this also offsets some of the other costs because they can generate some of their own power. This is actually a freestanding, an example of a freestanding uh, charger that can, can charge a vehicle in, in, in parking lots. And these things aren't even plugged in. They're, they're essentially islanded in. And then of course, there's battery energy storage. As I mentioned, battery storage is coming down uh, significantly in cost. So this is becoming increasingly more cost-effective as well. Um, there's a number of different partners that we work with that can help with this. And, um, um, you know, primarily uh, integrating the, uh, basically what's called a microgrid where you integrate the entire system in, in one place. Uh, we haven't seen the demand for this as much here in Washington as I think we will in the near future. Uh, we've been fortunate, our grid has been far more stable than what we've seen in California. But I think that as climate messes up, messes up our ecosystem, uh, these, these will be in greater demand going into the future. And then of course, uh, we don't have it yet uh, because the vehicles have not accepted bi bi-directional charging for the most part, or most haven't, there are a few that have. But I think uh, in, in the next several years, once these become standardized through the Charin standard in 2025, we'll be seeing the ability for vehicles to charge the, the, the grid or other buildings or even other vehicles. So the way I would imagine this could work is that if you had a mixed fleet, which most uh, vehicle fleets are in, in municipal level, we've got um, uh, vehicles that are used by say building inspectors and others that are used by police and the power died, you could use the, the mission non-critical vehicle like an inspector's vehicle to charge a mission critical vehicle like a police cruiser. Um, or you can use it to charge um, your building at, during peak power demands to reduce um, your peak demand and, and reduce your energy costs. So some of the technologies going forward that I think are really important to think about when we're planning, because if you think about what an electric vehicle fleet is, it's a, uh, it's a dispatchable power source and it's an incredible resource to be able to use. And there's a number of manufacturers already that are building these kind of technologies that we're working with uh, to help uh, going forward and, and plan for our, our fleet's needs. So that's it for my slides. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Wow, that was a very informative presentation, Mike. I think you covered a lot of ground. Uh, just, we have a Q&A question here that we'd like to ask. Um, someone asked about the idea of renting batteries and refueling batteries, and, and I've been researching that a little bit. Battery rental came about as a way to reduce the capital expenditure and shift the cost of batteries um, to kind of a month to month basis, especially for transit operators who generally didn't have the most flexible budgets. But the idea of battery swaps it seems to be gaining some traction, but you know, we're seeing the potential for um, really high speed charging, it looks like. Uh, and when we're talking about high speed charging, maybe we can do a twofer on these questions. Um, I am, of course, studying the grid just as you are, Mike, and I'm very concerned that the grid doesn't have the capacity to charge and that we're really going to need those distributed energy storage systems. So what do you think about battery swapping and the need to really think about um, essentially finding ways to reduce the load on the grid instantaneously. Well, you know, I, I think battery swapping makes incredible sense. And, you know, if you think of it for historical precedent, precedent look back uh, at the Pony Express, which was the original form of battery, uh, you know, um, you know, that's basically what that was, right? You, the, the Pony Express rider would switch horses every so many miles because the horse got exhausted and, you know, hop on another horse. And, and that, that model should, I think, have been applied uh, to electromobility. And frankly, I'm surprised that it hasn't. Um, I know there's a startup in China that's been exploring this, and I think maybe it will work in China, but I haven't yet seen it commercialized. But from a, from a, from a physics and from an economics point of view, it, it would seem to make sense. I just haven't seen much happening um, 
here. One, one thing there is discussion of, and this is something that I have been talking to some of my clients about, is sort of um, charging as a service or infrastructure as a service, whereby you're leasing portions of the whole electromobility spectrum, whether that be the vehicle fleet or the chargers or even a portion. And I know, I know in the transit world, um, it's possible to lease uh, the batteries and not have to own them. Um, but I don't, I personally haven't had direct experience with this, in, at least with, with my with my project experience. Great. Uh, but I do think we, we really are looking at uh, substantial stress on our electric grid, given that um, some of the research that's been done shows that the energy needs for vehicles, if they were to go all electric, are essentially twice the um, generating capacity that currently exists in the United States, uh, which is a yeah, stunning yeah. figure. Yes, but the the key is and this is really important and that is if you look at demand on a on a per time basis it's it's a, it's at peak periods you know, most vehicles are, are only used uh five to six percent of the time the rest of the time they're parked so if we had bi-directional charging and then we had v2g vehicle to grid integration um that would help the grid and and could really provide grid services so if we if we weren't if it wasn't one direction, it was bi-directional, and it's technically capable of doing that. That would address a huge amount of that. Ultimately, we will probably need to expand our demand, not just because of vehicles, but because we're also electrifying everything else. I mean, we're not just electrifying transportation; we're electrifying our buildings, replacing natural gas with electricity. So the overall demand will grow, um, but we can do it smartly and, and do it much more cost-effectively with bi-directional charging. Yep, and we are we are very much looking forward to also seeing an expansion, of course, of renewables, particularly solar, which combined with battery storage is going to be very promising. And I've been working with a number of startups in the battery storage industry, and particularly those that are looking to reuse these batteries um, once they uh, end their useful life in a vehicle. They still have a lot of life left in um, just in energy storage applications, and that's going to close that cycle on recycling. Mike. Uh, great to have you here. Great to be working with you again. And uh, we will be uh, looking to continue to um, introduce you to folks on uh, the, the uh, webinar today who maybe have other questions. So at this time, I'd like to um, turn it over to Bruce to introduce uh, our next speaker. Okay. Can you hear me, Scott? Yep. You're, you are all set. Okay. For some reason, it says unable to start video. But in any event, as long as you can hear me, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Peterson. Uh, David is the Director of Fleet Solutions for ChargePoint. Um, ChargePoint Fleet Solutions focuses on developing market-leading products and services for managing and operating light, medium, and heavy-duty electric vehicle fleets. David joined ChargePoint from Nissan, where he led the EV market development and charging infrastructure strategy team. And just a personal note, uh, David, I'm on my uh, fourth leaf. So, so it, the, the uh, range gets better and the batteries get better. Um, it's a good product. So thanks for joining us, David. Thank you. Thanks for, for hosting me. Um, lots of great info on this, uh, in this event. So this is, this is good to be a part of. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let me share my screen. And here we go in the presentation mode. Your screen is live, David. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So actually, I thought I'd kick it off with a little trivia to lighten it up a bit. I just grabbed one, uh, figuring we've been on this call now for about, what, an hour or so? Um, <clears throat> so uh, in what year was the land speed record of 100 kilometers per hour achieved by an electric vehicle? Um, so I guess, you know, type in the comments or Google it or take a guess. Um, kudos if you get the century right, uh, but it was two centuries ago, uh, or at least it was in the uh, 19th century. 1899, uh, the count, the electric count in France uh, set the record. And I, I kind of like this piece of trivia because, you know, as much as we like to think, you know, this, this, this whole event is about looking forward, right? But sometimes it's nice to look backwards and see where where we started or how far we've come. And I like the analogy of uh, the Pony Express and horses effectively being sort of a proxy for batteries um, or energy stored. 
um, which is which is kind of cool. So anyway, certainly things have come a long way, and uh, certainly in the ten years that I've been in this industry, with battery prices hovering near a thousand or at the pack level hovering near a thousand dollars per kilowatt hour, and coming down to you know under under two hundred. I think we're under one fifty now, but uh, there's some good resources out there that I, I track all this. Um, so thanks, thanks for that introduction. Um, I know it's late in the day, so I want to make sure we keep things kind of light and focused, um, but informative. Um, so at ChargePoint, you probably know us, you're most familiar with us if you've heard of us before, um, because you have a home charging station or you've charged at work or at a retail location. Um, the company's been around 13 years. Um, and uh, it's grown to be you know, quite large. Uh, we're now publicly traded. We're over 800 or about 800 people with headquarters in um, Campbell, California, which is in Silicon Valley or the San Jose area. Um, and we have our European headquarters in Amsterdam. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. What I'd love to talk to you about is how we approach fleet. Um, and the perspective I'm gonna take is really about kind of the three places you would consider fueling a fleet. Uh, there's at home, if you're a take home fleet, for example, or home charging needs to be part of the solution, uh, on route and at a depot. And you could think of the depot as a large bus depot, or you could think of it as you know, a workplace that you know, is effectively a depot for your fleet vehicles overnight, right? So if you have mixed use charging where um, you charge your employee and uh, visitor vehicles during the day and you charge the fleet at night, you can think of that as a depot. So this is a bit on charge point. Um, so we have uh, a range of charging stations that we uh, design, uh, manufacture and sell um, covering AC and DC. Um, and the key point with AC and DC was as I think, I um, can't remember who mentioned it, but basically whether the onboard, I think the big takeaway, um, there's a lot with AC and DC that, that we could talk about. But the big takeaway is that with AC power, you're going to have to have an onboard conversion from AC to DC because the battery takes DC, the grid supplies you with AC in 99% of cases. Um, and therefore where the conversion takes place is really important um, because on the vehicle side, as you move up to higher and higher power, that adds more weight, more cost, and in some cases, it can add a limitation because you're constrained by whatever the, um, the conversion capabilities are of that unit on the vehicle. So you're moving that off board. Um, so we have a range of AC and DC products. Um, and then we also uh, design cloud and sell cloud software and support services. We'll talk a bit about those in a moment. But um, the, the cloud services, which I think are going to be of most interest here, are really all about managing the charging station, but also for a fleet integrating within that fleet's ecosystem. So you have seamless operation with electric. Um, and that's important for a number of reasons, uh, but a lot of fleets, unless they're born electric, um, are in a transition moving from, you know, uh, petroleum fuels generally to electric. And you need to have the ability as a fleet manager to have 360 visibility, not just on what's happening with the electric portion of your fleet and not just what's happening with, let's call it the petroleum driven fleet, but all of it, and it all has to be integrated. And so that's part of what the cloud software can do. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then we also have some professional services to enable all of it. Um, so doing fleet assessments, um, design, engineering, construction, we're able to handle uh, projects of basically any scale for a customer. What's not on here is actually business models. And I heard about a couple of leasing ideas. Well, what's important for us is we align to the business models of our customers. Um, so whether that's an outright capital purchase of charging stations, software services and support, or a, a financed offering, and there are many different flavors, flavors of that, we can, we can do that. Uh, we also can install, own and operate ourselves. Um, and enter into fueling contracts with, uh, with a fleet operator. Um, we can stand up a depot and have an anchor tenant as a fleet operator. Um, so there's lots of, lots of different things that we can do. Um, it's early days for sure in some of that. Um, and so aggregating demand is pretty important um, to drive you know, some really good economics through uh, 
through these facilities, but there's lots of options there. And if you're interested in discussing that with me, feel free to, uh, to message me directly or ask the question here. Um, so I think the last presentation did a nice job of really kind of laying out the, the landscape for light duty vehicles. So it was pre predominantly focused on that. Um, but uh, in terms of commercial vehicles, starting with really kind of the lighter side, you know, class three, class four, this is like your transit, transit vans all the way through class eight, which is like a heavy duty, you know, uh, tractor trailer, really just the tractor um, or a low floor transit bus. And uh, also including off-road vehicles, there's a lot of product out there in production. That's the far right of the slide. There's product that's actually selling today. You can purchase it, but it won't necessarily be delivered right away. Um, and then there's a lot that's in sort of the trial phase. Um, and I heard about uh, Freightliner. Uh, someone mentioned that earlier. Absolutely. And Freightliner is, um, you know, it's got, they've got their test fleet, their customer experience fleet out there. They've talked about that. Um, and, you know, they'll start manufacturing, you know, probably sometime next year and then ramping up from there. So the volumes aren't, you know, where we want them to be yet, uh, but that's coming. Um, so we're really excited about that. So in terms of where you fuel, right, you're going to fuel at a depot on route, route homes I was talking about. So if you focus first on the depot, you know, there's a lot of considerations and I think these have been more than sufficiently covered here about thinking about the routes and trying to right size and what are the capabilities of the vehicles and we saw a nice chart that talked about all the different ranges and it's absolutely true higher voltage usually what what comes with uh you know the larger the larger vehicles is higher voltage batteries which is really great um because you need less current to deliver um you know a specified amount of power which is really awesome um, and so the kind of power levels we're talking about, though, are actually not necessarily tied to uh, the size of the vehicle, at least in terms of what you would need to charge. It's not necessarily this linear relationship between size of battery, amount of power that you need. Remember, the size of the battery is to support the route, the amount of power you need or support the work that the vehicle is doing. The amount of power you need is actually tied to the charging the time you have to charge the vehicle or the manner in which you're charging. So there was this uh, comment made about, um, I think there was a charging pyramid. Um, and I appreciate that the message that's trying to be delivered there, which is you know generally right. Uh, but that faster charging is more expensive and that slower charging is less expensive. And that's kind of true, um, except that when you look at it as a system, Right. If you have a whole bunch of vehicles that are installed at a location, say you had like 20 Freightliner e Cascadia's all parked and charging, you can actually, that same infrastructure can charge vehicles really fast, but it's actually pretty cost effective because what you're doing, and this is sort of the benefits of DC charging, is you're amortizing all the costs of the power conversion equipment. And why you can do that is because of electrical switching. So you could charge one vehicle, charge the next, charge the next, charge the next, and you're effectively dividing, take power equipment divided by number of vehicles charged within a certain period, and or rather the cost of that equipment. And that means that you've got a pretty cost-effective charging system. So the more vehicles you can charge with a given set of power conversion equipment, the cheaper it's gonna be. The more it's a one-to-one -one relationship, the more expensive it's gonna be. So the DC, the AC paradigm, in charging is kind of one-to-one. -one. Now you can do some panel sharing and you can do some things like that. Um, it's a bit limiting, but with DC, it varies. You can have one-to-one, -one, but that's expensive. Um, or I shouldn't say it's necessarily expensive. It's just not as cost effective as if you were spreading out the, all of that cost and charging a large number of vehicles. So, so it's really interesting when you look at the economics of DC, it's, it's not necessarily sort of a, a um, the AC paradigm doesn't translate over to DC uh, because of what you can do with, uh, with switching. Um, so something else to think about though is, you know, all the fleet tools that um, you use uh, or fleet uses, and it doesn't matter what type of fleet, whether they're using it for asset management, fuel management, routing and dispatch, you want to be able to integrate with that. And um, that's really core to what, what we do at ChargePoint in terms of our software. 
So being able to take in a whole bunch of different inputs and produce a basically crunch algorithmically, right? An output that says deliver this much power to this vehicle such that it can, you know, be ready to go with say 15 minutes, 15 minutes prior to departure or however we set the, the, the parameters. So that's really critical. So as you scale your fleet, um, this kind of integration is gonna be critical because the way it's largely gonna work and especially in an autonomous world, the vehicles are gonna come in and charge themselves um, or at least connect themselves or whatever the interface is um, that, that, that's still in development. I think I don't, there's no standard interface as far as automated connections go. Um, there's wireless connections, there's um, contactors such as reverse pantograph for, for the transit space. But whatever the connection mechanism, whatever that is, whatever that interface is, the software is still controlling how much power gets to, delivered to the vehicle and when. Um, so the way it's going to happen, even with somebody today manually plugging in, is they plug in, they walk away. Um, and then there's no one at the yard, unless it's a really active yard and there's somebody monitoring. But there's typically no one in the facility who's monitoring that vehicle and, and seeing if it's charging or not. And so having a fully integrated system that can send alerts, um, notify someone at the site, notify a supervisor that there's an issue, and then quickly being able to triage if it's a vehicle issue or charging issue is really critical. So all these integrations are really important. Now on route charging is really interesting. Um, this is where you know certain use cases uh, aren't very well supported, right? So if you think of like over the road trucking, right? That use case isn't really well supported by, by at least the current state of uh, trucking uh, electric technology. Um, but that will come. Um, and then there are different sort of use cases within that, right? Um, depending on the type of utilization that you wanna get out of your vehicle. And usually you wanna get as high utilization as you possibly can. So you wanna turn those vehicles around quickly. Um, charging can take some time. Um, and so development of like a megawatt connector standard is underway. There are different organizations working on that. Um, so we're not quite there yet as an industry, but there's general convergence on other DC technologies, such as uh, what's been generally adopted by the Society of Automotive Engineers. So if you look at SAJ 1772 and uh, specifically CCS1, that's pretty much the same connector that's being used for light duty all the way through to heavy duty. Um, as far as plug-in goes. It's generally adopted by most OEMs. But on route is today typically complementary um, in most fleet applications because charging equals downtime, which equals opportunity cost, right? So that's money lost, uh, revenue lost. Um, and so most fleets are not keen on having uh, charging happen during business hours or operating hours. Um, so it's usually complementary to home charging or to depot charging, um, unless the cost is being, being incurred by an individual and it's not on company time, um, such as if you were driving for Lyft, for example, and you didn't have a ride and you're fueling your vehicle. Um, so in, to enable that, right, ChargePoint has a really large network of, you know, hundreds of DC stations across uh, the US and certainly across the Pacific Northwest. But we also are enabling roaming um, on our network. So drivers today can roam across the following networks that you see there. Um, and what's really cool about what we're doing in the industry is those are all peer-to-peer -peer, um, agreements. Um, so there's no transaction fees. This is all being done peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, company to company. And so we enable that for the drivers and there's reciprocity with the other uh, networks. And so this is something that's really important for drivers um, today. And then we're also enabling it with um, fleet cards. And so coming soon, we'll be uh, uh, launching that feature. So if you're a fleet that uses uh, you know, fleet cards to pay and track for fuel, that will be enabled as well um, with roaming. And the last thing I wanted to touch on was really um, home charging. And, you know, when we think about fleets, we don't necessarily think about home charging, but this is actually a huge, huge area. Um, especially as, you know, we see the rise in, in last mile e-commerce um, or last mile deliveries largely driven by e-commerce. Um, this is becoming really important. 
and I say e-commerce, but it's sort of really like internet enabled deliveries, right? Uh, DoorDash, I would mean, say call e-commerce, but, um, but this is huge. Uh, and this is a new type of, of fleet, but there's also the other side of this, which is, you know, the pharmaceutical route that gets a vehicle and that's a fleet because the fleet operator technically there is what we call FMCs or fleet management companies, companies like lease plan, ARI, Element, they lease vehicles to, on behalf of, um, you know, corporations to individuals. Um, and they also lease to, to other fleets as well. So many cities use, you know, the services of an FMC, for example. They're effectively just leasing companies, but take home applications are, are really important and represent a large segment, a large portion of their business. Um, so, so this piece of it requires a, a bit of ingenuity. And this is one of the coolest areas that, that we've been working on recently. And so being able to seamlessly just dispatch someone, really dispatch a electrical contractor, do an assessment of what it takes to do the installation, whether it's in a multifamily or single family home, um, provide the estimate and then get the installation done. Um, that's, that's all done through us in sort of almost a, a push of a button. It's, it's, it's getting that easy. Um, but where this gets really interesting is with the ability to actually track and pay for fuel. So now you're fueling at home, which is the whole novel thing. Right? So you never have to go to a gas station again. You just drive home and plug in. Now you're fueling at home. So the fuel reimbursements look different. Right? So now we're tracking your fueling at home. We're tracking how much that costs. And then your employer or really your, the FMC doing this on behalf of the employer as reimbursing you for, for your fuel expenses. Um, and then, of course, we're also tracking all the fuel that you, fueling that you do on route. And you can toggle between what you do at home, what's for personal use, what's for business use. And so we're pretty excited about um, you know, this integration or this, this, uh, this offering that we have uh, in support of the FMCs, but it really can branch out into so many different areas as you can imagine, right? With the ACEs sort of paradigm in terms of shared mobility and ride handling and vehicles, um, you know, sort of home-based or home-fueled vehicles being part of increasingly being a part of uh, at least the electric ones, I should say, being increasingly a part of you know what uh, is available on on various ride hailing apps. This becomes pretty critical. Um, and I think I just talked about the home reimbursement piece, but um, but anyway, so I just wanted to kind of shed some light on a few of these different areas, right? So home, on route, and and depot fueling, and and you know where where we add value, where we've been playing. Um, and just give you kind of a, like a, a high level understanding of where we're at. So um, with that, I'll wrap up and um, be happy to, to take any questions. Well, thank you, David. Um, very informative and a great look into what uh, ChargePoint's vision is for charging networks. Uh, I'm intrigued by the home charging um, option that you mentioned. And I think as people find the shared ride mobility services and connections to public transit to become easier in the future in suburban areas, we might see more at-home parking of fleet vehicles that are used by um, the people who operate those vehicles. So I think that's a that's a compelling vision for the future. So thank you. Um, you know, the question that I would have is, uh, you, you mentioned, of course, the charge point is basically offering end-to-end -end solutions. Uh, what does it look like for you right now to uh, partner with renewable energy providers who would install solar plus battery systems on site? with uh, charge point units? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, for us, the, the integration happens at the software level. Um, so there's a set of, there's an objective, right? Um, that, you know, the solar and the storage has, right? Whether it's grid services, whether it's setting up a microgrid, right? There's some, there's some reason for its existence that might be in, completely independent of, of the electric vehicle deployment. Um, and so understanding kind of what the objectives are and then tying that up really with software. So if there's a site controller or for, you know, whatever the interface is, we can interface with that. Um, and then tie that into the, to the charging and charging plan. Um, so, um, so then it's, once you have that technical integration done, then it's about what the objectives are, right? So is the objective to tie, to do direct solar to vehicle? Is it, you know, 
that's where things get interesting in terms of how you'd want to set this up. Um, but yeah, the interface is absolutely at the software level. Um, and then certainly there's, you know, sort of the system view of, of how you're, you're accounting for it all. So is this direct tie into the charging or is it sort of all done with, through the grid and, and sort of aggregated that way um, where you're pulling grid charging, but you're also supplying solar back to the grid. So many different things you could do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for us, it's, it's pretty easy to, to get set up. Yeah, but that again points out that uh, in today's world, data capture is value capture. And I think that that's a very uh, important thing for us to remember is that the more we understand about how people are using energy and transportation, the, the better we can plan and react and provide the kinds of products that people want in the market. So David, we can't thank you enough for being here today. And we're thrilled that ChargePoint is an affiliate of the ACES Northwest Network. I'm excited to launch. Yeah, so you're very welcome. I'm excited to launch uh, a poll here um, just before introducing our next speaker. And the question is, do you personally own an electric vehicle? So the poll should be appearing on your screen shortly and we'll share the results uh, in just a moment. And while we're doing that, it's worth reminding everyone right now that we are also planning for a virtual happy hour. It turns out that despite um, me being an engineer and making a comprehensive and complex spreadsheet, we are just a few minutes behind. Um, but you're all sticking with us today and we're thrilled for that. And if you can stick around for the happy hour, we will have this Zoom room open uh, for probably at least 30 minutes uh, after the event ends today. I will be uh, sharing the results of the poll here in 30 seconds. If you haven't taken our poll yet, it appears on your screen. We invite you to take it. We'll share the results of the poll in about 20 seconds. We have almost two thirds of our participants have voted. We're gonna end the polling in about 15 seconds. Again, do you personally own an electric vehicle? Thank you for participating in the poll. It's time to share those results. You can see the results on your screen. It looks like approximately a third of our participants own one EV and uh, almost half of our participants um, have EVs in their personal fleet. Um, a third of you say that you plan to purchase an EV soon. And I hope that you're also thinking about um, how that fits into your renewable energy plan for your residence or business. 16% um, of you said that you don't have plans to purchase an EV. And uh, of course, we all have our own reasons for maybe holding on to vehicles that we have. And I'd love to hear um, you know, what you might be thinking in the comments. And 11% of you formerly owned an EV. And of course, if that was a few years ago, you know that that technology has come a long way. So thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts in our poll today. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. And I am going to be thrilled to introduce Andrea Tusignat. Uh, she is a consultant who has done work all throughout the Pacific Northwest, including extensive uh, charging infrastructure work in Alaska. Um, she'll be unmuting here momentarily to join us from IONS for EVs and talk to us about what it takes to get your fleet charging infrastructure and your fleet off the ground. Andrea, welcome. Thank you. And you want me to go ahead and share my screen then? Yes, please. All right. Oh, I got to get the right one. All right, so let's jump in here. And looks like you've got PowerPoint up. What's it? What's that? Yep, looks like PowerPoint is up and then. All right. Oh, that went yeah. back. Yep. Sorry. Yep. All right, how do I go back one? Got it, figured it out. All right. I'm Andrea Chisnia. I am IONS for EVs is a, a small business consulting business, transportation electrification consulting business that I have. Um, I started off about six years ago working with a solar installer. Um, and doing residential and then commercial and, um, sorry, state contract. And I also worked for two years with a um, distributor, National Car Charging, where I sold ChargePoint, EV Box, and FSEC, and a few other providers. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you about uh, fleet electrifications and some innovative funding mechanisms that we found and um, that Scott and Bruce provided to me that I uh, learned about. And I'm going to share a little bit with you about fleets. I know that David and um, Scott and Mike have covered pretty well, so I don't think there's a lot to say. 
about fleets. Um, I'm currently working with a green transportation program, creating a fleet assessment tool for public fleets. Um, I think it was about four years ago, there was a law passed to electrify all public agencies and city fleets as applicable or anyway, as possible. And so uh, we're working together to give these organizations tools to be able to electrify. And as Scott mentioned, I'm also working with the Alaska EV Working Group, which is working to electrify, well, putting in the first DC fast charging in the state of Alaska with a Volkswagen settlement money. So that's been sort of interesting and it's actually where I'm from originally. So it's nice to be able to help them out with things that I've learned here in Washington. Um, so transportation electrification, um, we're at the tipping point. There's 63,000 electric cars in the state of Washington. So it's, it's really, you know, giving us the scale that we need. Um, and also key drivers, there's $300 billion being spent nation, I mean, internationally. Uh, regulations are starting to match. It's, we're being able, able to get um, different codes and um, the things that we need in construction to be able to ensure that there is charging in new buildings. And as everyone really spoke earlier, that that lower cost of ownership is really reaching parity with the size and types of batteries. Um, let's see. Um, and so um, the vehicle models, uh, Washington state became a zero emission state last year. And so I know someone talked about compliance cars, but this is an example of compliance cars um, that, uh, and instead of having nine or 10 vehicles like we do now in the state, like from dealerships, there's gonna be many, many more. And you can kind of see the range of, of where those are. I don't know how to get this out of the way. Um, and so, yeah, this, the becoming a ZEV state requires automakers to ensure that a certain percentage of the vehicles are zero emission. And so that will be happening in the next couple of years. So electrification barriers, I just kind of wanted to throw this in is, really looking at your fleet, whatever fleet that you are responsible for, uh, looking at the community, how it affects that, uh, working in partnership with the utilities, and also um, really what's going on in Washington state uh, and in our landscape and what's gone on. Um, so corporate governance, um, really looking at each organization's sustainability goals, talking to the sustainability team. In the last year, your fleet owner has probably um, learned a lot about fleet electrification in this year of COVID. There have been so many articles and so many webinars that most fleet people have a good idea that total cost of ownership is, is really close to there, especially if they can find a program that's going to help pay for that infrastructure. Um, and this was just more about what Dave, David talked about is, are you going to be doing depot charging or are you going to do it, you know, disperse it around the community or like you said, residential. Um, so business case is, um, so the business case I'm going to talk about today was uh, put together by the Environmental Defense Fund, and it talks about increasing demand for last mile delivery and really targeting some of those health consequences in certain more industrial areas, and that the ZEV readiness is really here and making sure that we address the barriers. This is one of their financing approaches. Um, it's a really good paper and really goes into different areas of financing that you can be looking at. Um, and I have the, the link at the on the last slide. Um, and this is also evaluating those barriers, those hard cost barriers, the soft costs, the risks and uncertainties, not knowing what your electrical capacity is in your facility. And um, yeah, so it's this specific um, pro, um, program or several programs as accelerating zero emissions delivery um, and they talk about the different stakeholders, the shippers, public and private financing, working with your state and local government and working with your original or the, you know, the OEMs, the um, equipment manufacturers. Um, and so this, they call it the Z zone model, a zero emission de de delivery zone model. And it's an innovative financing mechanism that uses both public and private financing to, to help you, you know, convert your fleet and this fills, fills a critical gap um, and so why embrace it it's creating a lever for business customers it's uh, focusing on zero emissions and it's something that you can again do that partnership with public and private 
and also reducing delivery emissions within certain neighborhoods. And so this is all three models put together. Um, it's sort of blurry, so I'll just go into the first model, uh, sponsorship. And it's a business model where a large customer or collaboration bears the upfront costs and the carrier bears less risk in the short term. And so it's, well, as it says, it's a sponsorship model. The next one's more of a, um, they call it monthly minimum, sort of a membership model, more of a transport as a service or transit as a service. And all of these models really delving into them and learning about the specifics is, is pretty interesting, um, but takes a little bit more time than I have today. And this one is more of like an app based, um, like next month I'll need 7,000 miles. And then you would just request those miles based on this shared rental model. Um, so electrification part partnership is really what it's about. It's the public sector working with the with the private sector and working with providers and vendors and, and everyone within the ecosystem, looking for innovative solutions, who wins besides you, what does it look like in the community, um, leveraging the collective purchasing power is really the A number one thing that they want to talk about. And I have a little, a few more examples at the very end and partnering with um, any special community or transit organizations. And again, partnership with utilities. Speaking of the utilities, uh, last year, a really great report on the West Coast came out and it's this West Coast Clean Transit Corridor. And the utilities got together to look at opportunities along the coast for installing charging for medium heavy duty and really more of the semi trucks. Um, but also some of the, you know, the shuttles and the smaller box trucks, and they just create a bunch of shovel ready projects or projects that could be shovel ready pretty quickly. And the utility is just, I talk about that partnership as being just an important conversation early on. You want to make sure that the transformer near your site um, can handle the electricity that you're about to, to send out. It's a lot of electricity, especially if you're doing some of that larger DC fast charging. Um, and partnerships, um, the Washington Department of Health has a really great model of disparity studies. So you can see block by block what some of the um, problems might be in that neighborhood and it might help site a better location, a place that you don't want to have diesel trucks or like that. Um, obviously the utilities, Puget Sound Energy, uh, City Light, Tacoma Public Utilities and Snowpod all are spending money on transportation electrification and are doing some great partnerships. Um, we know the port's doing that work. Um, and just growth. Um, a lot went on this year in the United States and, you know, really working carefully with the community, with the community to say, uh, how can we create equitable development solutions is really important. And that's something I think that um, we need to continue to think about. And then charging and landscape, just talk with you about what's going on in Washington state. Um, so as we know, so, so the last biennium, we had close to $40 million that was going into some level of transportation electrification. Um, and as we know, WashDOT has the West Coast Green Highway. They spent $2 million on the EDIPP program, which just put in, I think, nine new um, DC fast charger locations or took locations and gave them several DC fast chargers. And then there's another two year program coming up. I think in May it opens up. They did some transit funding. So they um, turned some transit agencies. Um, I think we have like 16 transit agencies in the state of Washington that have electric buses and are expanding them quickly. Um, Department of Commerce spent $9.8 million and in the next biennium may have as much as $19 million and some of that money will be for innovative solutions and so talking to them about public private partnership um, is something that they're open to. Um, Department of Ecology just spent a, a bunch of money on uh, school bus grants, workplace grants, corridor charging from the Volkswagen settlement money um, and also we have the clean fuels legislation that's in the legislature right now that may pass. And if it does, there will be more money for Department of Ecology to spend on adding mostly charging infrastructure. Um, so upcoming, there are a lot of opportunities and we know that the Biden administration should have plans. It sounds like we're gonna start hearing in the May, June timeline about what they will have for Washington State. Um, and these are purchasing collaboratives. I mean, you might have heard of them already, but it's just something that's great to track. Um, they, since it's a collaboration, there are just better pricing for some of the hardware that you can purchase. And um, this is also another just organization that you can sign on to and they help drive demand for um, 
increasing electric vehicle adoption. And this is the last slide. So hopefully I did that fast enough. Um, this is the, the link for financing the transition for the Environmental Defense Council. And um, I'm Andrea Tisnia. So thank you so much. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Andrea. That was an incredible wrap up. Um, we had been uh, working in the ACES Northwest Network uh, in touch with uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, but I asked Andrea to take their report and put it together because I know that she's done a lot of work in the Pacific Northwest. And I think that your perspective, Andrea, on the opportunities for funding and the partnership opportunities uh, just really shows us how far we've come in this industry. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, Washington State is uh, requiring a certain percentage of EVs to be sold. Uh, do you think that we will be meeting those targets? And, and, and do you think, what do you, what do you see in the funding opportunities that's really going to help us achieve the goal that the legislature set, which sometimes can distort markets? It looks like you want to unmute. <laughs> Becoming a dev state is a program. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to gain. And it's true. Just because the dealership has to bring the cars into the state doesn't mean that they'll be sold or that people will purchase them. Um, but it is a start and especially alongside a clean fuels initiative, um, people will understand more about what's available. When they only see three or four cars out there, they don't know that there's you know, 46 cars that are available that might fit their needs. So I think it's more likely that we'll have the smaller SUVs that will have you know, all of the different cars. And I think that's better for light duty adoption. I don't know that it will do anything for fleets, but the fact that Washington State has a fleet electrification requirement for all public agencies is is huge. I mean, again, that's going to be one of those collaborative, collaborative purchasing agreements. You know, there is a state contract within the state, and so that means it's less expensive and easier for people to, you know, look at that initial expense and be okay with it if it's not that much more than their regular car. So, I think something I've learned a lot working with fleets, and I know Mike probably has learned this too, but um, sometimes they don't really know what they need. They aren't capturing that data, and so. How do we capture that data so they need to buy six cars, not 16 cars? And so that's the kind of thing that we're working on is, you know, do you really need all those cars? And uh, anyway, that's, sorry, that's not really about the Zev state, but yeah, I mean, I think that's an analysis that we have to do. We have to look into what's working. Um, the Department of Ecology is spending a lot of time gathering metrics now, so we'll have a really good baseline, and we should know. And and the states that do have it, like look at California. We always talk about everybody who works in EVs goes to California to work because they have a, a low carbon fund and they have a way to fund all of these programs. And so that's what the clean fuel, fuel standard will do. So between a clean fuel standard and having the cars available. Um, there's just, it's so much more likelihood that we'll be able to take advantage of that. You went quiet. Uh, I, I can't find the mute button. It's time to invite you all now to keep an eye out for our next event in mid-May going vertical on uh, advanced air mobility. And it's also time for our happy hour. And I think the question for discussion has been um, put in the Q&A by John Niles. What is the future of en route charging away from home for level two charging? So if you're still on, uh, what we'll be doing here in the next minute is elevating um, all of our attendees uh, so that everyone can be in the same room together. And before we do that, I think Bruce will be unmuted here to um, thank you all for attending our event. Hey, it looks like Bruce may be having a bit of technical difficulty. Of course, we're, we're very happy that the internet works most of the time. So in the absence of uh, having Bruce uh, here, I'd like to personally thank everyone uh, for attending our ACES Northwest Network Charge Up Your Fleet event today. We're thrilled that you're all here. We're thrilled for your questions. We're also very much looking forward to an opportunity to socialize here virtually during our virtual happy hour. On behalf of the ACES Northwest Network and the Cascadia First Center, Center for Regional Development and my colleague, Bruce Agnew, we'd like to thank you for your support of our network and your support of this important work in transportation. Thanks for being here and let's get the happy hour started. <laughs>